this is going to be a changing day in your life. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. It matters to you. That's what I want to talk about. Are we ready in the booth? Let's do it. What if you had to deal with this every day? Kids kicking and screaming, doors slamming, dogs barking, parents yelling nonstop noise. Now, my first guest, Jessie, says that she desperately needs to be rescued from this chaotic life. She claims that while she's stuck in this madness, her husband, Jeremy, escapes by literally running to the hills every day. What? I am an overwhelmed mom with a no. very chaotic family. Look at this mess. Do you hear Aiden? What? There is always arguing and screaming and yelling. Hey! No. Now! Oh, please. Right now we're headed to go get the kids from school. Every day at 6 o'clock my day starts. Daycare kids start arriving. I'm taking them to school. Then I'm doing snack time, walking the dogs, cooking, cleaning. Jeremy comes home at 6.30. The chaos begins once again. Look at this mess. I need help cleaning. I think Jessie can do more during the day. Do dishes, the laundry. I think she purposely save these things for me. You gotta appreciate that she has all this free time. She can do whatever she wants to do and doesn't have like a boss responsibility. To me, it's like not really work. Jeremy and I argue constantly. And why were you badgering me about it at 9.45? Because that's the time that an adult is supposed to have their conversation. Because Jeremy and I argue, I think the kids argue, and they hit and push and shove. Both my kids are out of control. I'm gonna take the DS if you don't put the vacuum away, Aiden. No, please stop. They scream and yell. I tell Aiden not to go up there all the time. He doesn't listen. They charge up and down stairs. Give me the DS, Aiden. They slam doors. Aiden! Lock themselves in their room. I'm gonna count to three, and then I'm gonna pick the lock and take that DS for a week. No, no. Open this door right now. No! With Jesse, everything is wrong. Nothing is right. He doesn't get apple juice in a glass cup. Oh, sorry. What well, this is... They're right there, the blue cup. Pour it. Jeremy is obsessed with hiking. I love being outside. I'm stuck in an office all day. Jeremy comes home after work, then hightails it hiking. Aiden cries when <laughs> Jeremy goes hiking because Aiden wants Jeremy, his dad, to play with them. Yeah. This is why I get out. This is why. Jesse doesn't hate the fact that I hike. She just hates the fact that I do anything without her. 24-7, I'm a mother and a wife and a father and the caretaker all wrapped up into one. If Jeremy doesn't change and this goes on and on and on, I really don't know how much longer I could deal with this. Hand it back to me now. Okay, what do you think about watching that? Well, I think that you're missing my side of it. It seems like it's all about her. The thing is, when I try to have a conversation with Jess, uh, she uh, attacks me. She likes to assign blame. She just ends up bickering with me, and it becomes an irrational conversation. So she doesn't see my side of it. Aren't you blaming her for this chaos? I'll blame myself for when she acts that way. I don't know how to react. What do you think she does all day? Well, she takes care of the kids, and I absolutely appreciate what she does because we couldn't I don't live... think you do. No, I do, and I tell her that. Yeah, and you have a daycare, right? Yes. And how many children do you have? Six. Six? <laughs> okay, you take care of six kids most of the day. Yes. And this, this is her routine. 6 a.m., wakes up, 7, makes breakfast for her own kids, and daycare kids start arriving. 7.30, takes her own kids to school, takes two daycare kids with her. 7.40, feeds the two daycare kids who have arrived for breakfast. 8 o'clock, drives to the dog park with two kids and two dogs. 9 a.m., drives back home. 9 to 10.30, change in diapers, interacting with the kids. 10.30, picks up third daycare kids from preschool. 11.30, picks up fourth daycare kid. From kindergarten, 12 to 12.30, 12 uh, heads home and prepares lunch. 2.45, packs up daycare kids in the car, picks up Alicia, Aiden, and one more daycare child from the school bus stop. Homework, snacks, changing, soccer practice, daycare kids go home, cleans house, does chores, showers, bedtime for Aiden, bonding time with her daughter, and then 9.30, finally bedtime. Okay. So where is... <laughs> well... Okay, what? Well, she's organized that, and it, and it works very well. She developed a system during the day. How do and, you know you're hiking? Well, no, I'm only hiking an hour a day. That's all I do. And she makes it seem like I'm hiking. And if I were to go to the gym and work out for an hour, I mean, that's reasonable. It's not like I'm hiking. I would love to go to Yosemite, uh, to, to these places, but I'm you hiking locally. You say you're going to hike a 1,000 days in a row? Yes. And what day are you on? I'm on 70-something right now. 
So you got a lot to go. Yeah, just every day, but it's not. I, yeah. Look, I aspire to do long hikes, and right now I'm just doing very short hikes. Well, he says you're just overreacting to all this. You need to calm down. Please. Quit bickering. Just chat up, chat him up about this. I what agree. I agree with calming down, yes, but I need help. And I can't calm down if I don't have help with everything. Not just, well, I'm here. Isn't that enough? Because you go to work at 7.30, right? No, I leave the house at, at about, no, I wake up at 6. I make coffee for her, for us, and then okay. I leave at 6.30. Uh -huh. And then I'm off work around 3.30, and that's when I go hiking. I'm back home by 6. 30. 6 o'clock. 30. 5.30. I mean, it, 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 again, the time doesn't matter. It's between 5.30 and 6, normally. Okay, so you, you get off at 3.30, and then you're hiking till 6.30. No, then you come home and blog about no, no, it, right? No, I, I hike for one hour, and then I have to drive 45 minutes home from work. Okay, that's part of the commute. So right. I'm home by 6, and when I get in the house, she okay. usually has a dinner ready, and I'm eating, and I'll you know, help with the kids. You know, Sometimes I make the dinner because she's still at soccer practice. So I do help. I do dishes. And then I go up and blog because I want to share with the world because I, I'm animated about what what I just did, what I just saw, I want to upload the photos and put it on the computer so everyone can see what I did. Before he shares with his family. I would love to share with her, but she doesn't even read my blog. And when she does, she criticizes what I do. Instead of saying, well, because that's really cool. Like, I was like, look at this waterfall. She's like, I don't care. She doesn't support me at all. <laughs> what, do you know why she says, <laughs> do, do, you're in a room full of women, pretty much. <laughs> There's, there's, there's some men here, and I think they're starting to bail on you. But, uh, but you know why she says she doesn't care about that waterfall? She didn't experience it. She wasn't there. That mist that comes yeah. when the water hits the yeah. water and it blows in your face and the grass is whipping. She was um, packing four lunches, loading some kids up at the bus stop, uh, getting you know some gum out of somebody's hair. The way you two are coming together is not working. I want to give you a wake-up call here because I'm telling you, if you were sitting down there with a kid and they were in trouble with the law and been kicked out of school, you'd be sitting there, man, I wish somebody would have told me we were headed here before we got here. I'm telling you now. I'm telling you now. So you can look back and say, yeah, you know, he told us. He told us. I didn't much like him. I thought he was kind of on her side and throwing me under the bus. Blah, 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 blah. But he did tell me the truth. Okay. Think about that. Up next... Uh, Dr. Phil correspondent and mother, Kelly Catrone, is back. We'll see what happens when she paid Jesse and Jeremy a little house call, a visit to the home. Into the chaos. We'll be right back. Doorbell. Hi, I'm Kelly Catrone. Hi. Nice to meet you. Look at me. Say, my name is Aiden. Excuse me. Excellent. Aiden, move away from the window now. I'm going to count to three. And later, she was such a magnificent woman. We talked, we laughed, we did things that normal couples would do. And then, all of a sudden, she turned into this mean, hateful person. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. The photographs. Would you want to know tell you what. what your husband's mistress looks like? This is the woman he said I love you to. Oh, my oh my God. God. And a sudden outburst. I want to confront both of you. You're out of order. Leads to a confrontation with Dr. Phil. If you want to have a debate with me, just belly up, darling, because you are not going to win. That's tomorrow. Jess and I parent completely differently. Help me make some dog food. It'll be our project, okay? Come on. Yes, mommy wants you to do it. <laughs> the kids act the way they do because they see Jeremy acting immature like a child. Oh, no, 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 no. Go. Do yeah. not put ice cream cones in the dog's dishes. Yes, one of each. Yes. When I'm disciplining the kids and the dogs, Jeremy's telling them Jeremy, that stop. I'm off my rocker. I don't know what I'm talking about. They don't have to yeah, listen. Do and mommy's just a big meanie. Why does she say no? She always says no. But what are they going to eat? We don't have dog food. I'm not going out tonight. My bond with the kids is childish and playful. I can't be a serious parent. She won't allow it. Jeremy wants to be their friends. Grab him a napkin because it's going to get everywhere. It's fine. Here, cheers. Kelly Catrone is a special contributor to the show, and she's author of a great book. The title is, If You Have to Cry, Go Outside. 
and other things your mother never told you. Now, she is a woman of many accomplishments, but she says she feels her most cherished role is that of being a mom to eight-year-old Ava. Now, I sent her to visit Jesse and Jeremy, their seven-year-old son, Aiden, and Jesse's nine-year-old daughter, Alyssa. Hey, Dr. Phil, I'm out here to meet Jesse and Jeremy and their kids. Jesse says that their house is chaotic, and your team's made a DVD. Let's take a look and see what's really happening in that house. Aiden, do not make me chase you. No. Aiden called. No. Oh, my God. Look at this mess. Do you hear Aiden? It's like a combat zone, what's going on over in this house. What? A pair of plaid flannel boxers and some tube socks. That's not hot. Do not put my stuff in their dog dishes. Just a little bit. We'll get no. some like, broccoli and stuff. Oh, that's disgusting. No. Yes, the that is disgusting. There's more than one dog in this house. I think she needs a little ohm in her home. <laughs> that's what I think. Oh my God, that's their yard? If he likes hiking, he should just go hike into the garage and pick up a lawnmower. Doorbell. I'm Kelly Catron. It's nice to meet you. Dr. Phil sent me in. From one mom to another, is here to see how I can help. This is Kelly from the Hi. Doctor. Hi. I'm just going to hang out in the corner and watch what you guys are doing, okay? Hey, hey, hey. Oh my gosh. Sounds a lot. These oranges are really. Aiden, stop, please. Hey, we're going to do yes lemonade. No. Alyssa, stop them. Stop. Do you want to oh, cut it? Aiden, stop. Aiden. Aiden, get over here. Jeremy, Aiden. Jeremy, grab Aiden. 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 All right. Stand here. Aiden. Aiden, stop, please. We can eat that one. No, stop. He's dirty. Can I move that foil? Aiden, why did you just do that? Oh, my gosh. Can you stop? Are we doing orange juice or not? What? It's like the sun's going down, too, so we should go outside. Actually, Dr. Phil wanted me to just kind of do, just sit down with everybody, kind of. Alyssa, will you come and talk to me for a minute? Aiden, okay. come right. with me. You know. Okay, let's okay, go. We'll try it later, okay? So I'm on a TV show, and I work with Dr. Phil, and I'm not a doctor. I'm only a mommy. Aiden, you're looking at me. Eyes on me, mister. Stop it. No. Quiet. This is my interview. What? I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you go, yay for yes, and go boo for no. What? Please no. take your hands out of your mouth when I'm speaking to you. I'd like to see them clasped on your lap. Thank you. And look me in the eye. Sit up straight, too, by the way. This is not a party. Are you a good helper to your mommy? Yeah. Do not eat your boogers in front of me. I expect better manners with gentlemen I hang out with. Do not. Do not. So, can I ask you a question? Do you lick the furniture all the time? Is it something you do all the time? He licks the furniture a lot. He licks everything. I want you guys to take an oath. Put up your hand. Say, look at me. Say, my name is Aiden. Excuse me. My name is Aiden. My name is Aiden. And I'm going to try to help my mommy more. I'm going to try to help my mom. I, Alyssa. I, Alyssa. Give my word. Give my word. <laughs> that I'm going to be a better helper to my mommy. I'm going to be a better helper to my mom. Hey. Hey there. How's it going? It's going good. Spent some time with your kids. Oh boy, how was Aiden? He's good. Uh, he's Accelerated, but I think they're... impossible for me. Yes. He yeah, very much so. Aiden! Move away from the window now. I'm going to count to three. Jesse, Aiden's about to pop out the back window that overlooks the terrace. You should put a safety lock on that window, too, just yeah. in case he looks up there. What are your complaints about being the man in this house? Not wearing the pants, I guess, is maybe one. At first, I guess, it was a big issue, and yes, my coworkers make... What's it? Will your wife allow you to play poker with us tonight? Uh -huh. I'm a debt collector. It's easier for me to negotiate with my debtors than it is my wife. What was the last time you guys were alone? For our honeymoon, because since then, we've gone on vacations, but with the kids, of course. Okay, so you and, both you know, burned, but I think yeah. that you seem like you're actually willing to get back into a relationship with your wife. Uh, yes. Okay, that, to me, seems like a really great start. So Jeremy and Aiden is a sore topic. Tell me, what is that like? It's very much strained. Aiden wants to be a part of Jeremy, but neither one of them know how to connect. Jeremy likes to be very rambunctious with Aiden and very kind of chaotic. I think that's normal behavior for a dad. But I think Jeremy takes it too far, like he takes okay. the hiking too far. That's something that Dr. Phil, he's good at. I'm sure he can help you with that. Whoa. Hi, Dr. Phil. I just spent three hours with Jeremy and Jesse and their children. It seems like Jesse's, she seems to get overwhelmed. She starts to escalate and nag. And then Jeremy splits emotionally or physically, goes on a hike. And then there's a little boy who has a lot of energy. And I'm really looking forward to watching you work your magic with them in the studio. For God's sakes, do you not figure that what you're doing is not working? Well, we're here. I know it's not working, and that is why, why, why we're here. Hopefully this does help.
Well, you, you say you don't have time to interact with the kids? Well, I, she said that. I don't. He goes on you hikes don't with do, me. You don't, Jeremy. Sorry. Uh, I, I just well, ha I, you don't. I, don't I, I was at your house. Time. No, yeah. you don't, you're not doing... Even if you are like what I call like a pre-1970s dad that thinks like, you know, the guy's job is to take out the garbage, sort out the lawn, deal with the dogs, you get an F. The house is not up to par. You live on a corner property. Your yard's a mess. You have... He has a wee-wee pad wrapped around his tree outside his house that. next to his swing. I don't care. I thought that you had a tree surge in there. So their son, who swings and smashes himself into the side of the tree. This is how they're dealing with a child who's banging himself into the side of the tree. You're not carrying the weight. All you're doing all day is you're yelling at your kid all day, and everybody's swinging in and out of this situation. And Alyssa, by the way, she's an angel. She is. She's yeah. an angel. I mean, that little girl is just going with the flow, and you're not her biological father, and you moved him in a week after meeting him. No. So that's... No, not a week after Well, you met, and then he, you lived together, it right? Week, I mean, basically, it was... Basically... It was a while. You no, know, it was right away. Whatever. She... Yeah. Her whole thing is her life was probably a little smoother okay, what do you, before. What do you hear us... What, tell me what you're hearing so far. That Aiden's out of control, our life is out of control, we're not connecting, we're not on the same page, which is why we're here. Well, I, I don't, you know, I hate these overused terms like we're not connecting, we don't communicate, we're not on the same page. What it means basically, let's not use, use metaphors and euphemisms, let's talk about what it really is. You are teaching these kids that no one is in control. And when you see your son licking the furniture and doing these other ritualistic behaviors, he's just anxiety ridden. This is anxiety. This boy is just tied up in knots inside because of this chaos. You've got to calm this situation down. I don't care whether you think it's her fault or you think it's his fault. I don't care. F, F. It's not working and your kids are paying the price. So you got to stop trying to be right and win the argument and come out better in terms of perception. And you need to be figuring out something to do. We've been talking all of this time. Neither one of you have said, Dr. Phil, tell me something to do different. Dr. Phil, put a verb in your sentence. Dr. Phil, tell me what to do to save my children from this chaos. Neither one of you have asked. You've been barking at each other. Neither one of you have asked one specific question for help. We'll be right back. going to have to go commando about it. This isn't something you ease into. And so hear me, it's going to get worse before it gets better because when you start saying no more of this, they're going to freak. He's going to freak. And later, I should have listened to my friends who said Emily is a bitch. I'm stuck here because of you. That's a tough way to feel. If you really feel that way, you must be really miserable. Jeremy's obsession with hiking is almost destroying the family because it's hiking, 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 and then, oh, wait. Do I have a family? Oh, yes, there they are. One day, I just decided I'm going to go hiking for a 1,000 straight days. When I'm done hiking, the first thing I want to do is come home and share it. So I get on the computer, I upload the photos, and I write about my experience. With all the hiking that my husband does, he does not know the first thing about being a husband or a parent. You've seen him 0% today. I was just at, you have I'm going to take him 0%. hiking with... He has wet hair. He's not going out hiking. About three weeks ago, he lost his wedding ring. It crosses my mind that Jeremy might be off doing something else during these hikes. Am I stupid to believe he's really hiking? So, is Jeremy really in the woods hiking? Uh, so, because you had questions, we thought we'd do an investigation. Take a look. I decided to come over to the state park to check on Jeremy, who likes to hike here. Jesse says she thinks he's up to something. He lost his wedding ring, his hair is always a mess, and he spends all night on the internet. So for all the women who have ever felt like this, I decided to come out and just get an insider's view as to what Jeremy's really up to. Perfectly hit his mark. Flex those muscles, babe. <laughs> sure of himself.
Okay, so you, <laughs> so you can cross that one off your list, right? I mean, yes. obviously, he's doing exactly yes. what he told you he's doing, exactly where he tells you he's doing it. So, I mean, he's out yeah. hiking and jogging and doing healthy things. The two of you need to decide to stop blaming each other. You need to stop acting like a child, in your own words. You need to recognize that you're like the little boy that cried wolf. I mean, you've yelled so much, you've badgered and bickered so much, nobody cares anymore. And Aiden needs to be evaluated. Okay, I think he has some anxiety disorders. He may have some ADD or ADHD. He, and he's at an age now where you can evaluate him for that. What'd you say? No, I'm just like, no, I, I feel like ADHD and ADD is just so overused these days. I think you're right. He does have anxiety issues. And I think living in a hyper crazy environment is making him that way. I don't think it would. It's ADHD. So what's Unless wrong with, what's wrong with getting him tested, though. Just I no, mean, I'm wouldn't it be better that. to like say, "Hey, good news, he's not." Yeah, or, absolutely. If, he like, is, if you've ever yeah. watched this show, no, you've heard that. me say that those are wastebasket diagnoses that yes. are way yes. overused and applied. Absolutely. But the truth is that there is a neurological profile that determines whether or not he is neocortically underdeveloped. It's not an opinion; it's a matter of fact with okay. the technology we have today. And saying, no, I don't want that to be true is no solution. You're going to have to plug in here. If you want to keep doing the same things you've been doing, you're going to get the same result that you currently have. I'm telling you that the two of you need to fall back and decide that there is no good cop, bad cop here. You guys are going to have to establish some very predictable rules in this house that are calmly enforced and you're going to have to go commando about it. This isn't something you ease into. And so hear me, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Because when you start saying no more of this, they're going to freak. He's going to freak. And so he's going to ramp up and get worse for a day or two. And then it's, it's going to calm down. When I say commando, I'm saying if this little boy is out of control, then you need to take everything out of his world right now. He needs to have a bed and a blanket and a pillow. Nothing on the walls, no TV, no video games, no nothing. And he needs to learn, I can earn those back with good behavior. When I'm told to go to bed, if I do what I'm told, then I get to stay up that late the next night. He needs to understand that there are consequences to his actions and, and, and that you consistently enforce those things. Think about what I said. I will. Okay, I don't think you will. I think you've I decided will. that this didn't work out for you that I just don't get it because you're saying, I did that, I've done it, We're, I've, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. You are inconsistent, you yell and you scream, you are not listened to, the kids cannot predict the consequences of their actions with you, and as a result, you've got chaos. Unless and until you acknowledge that, this is not going to get better. I acknowledge that. I, I get that. We that's, acknowledge that. That's why I'm here. And, and we are here and we want to make this right. Okay. Well, I suggest that you get your son evaluated. We don't know the first step about I will arrange health, for that. Don't even have health insurance. I will arrange for right. that. Okay. I, I will arrange for that. Thank I will you. arrange for it to get done. I will make it happen. Don't worry about insurance. Don't worry about finding the right person. I will get that evaluated. Okay. And then when I give you the information, if you misuse it because you don't want to hear the results, I can't help you. I can't help you. You need help. You need somebody to come in and restructure this household I along agree. the lines that I'm talking that. about. And I, and I will arrange for that as well. And I, you know what I'm going to tell them? I'm going to tell them when you argue the first time to fold up their tent and leave. Because I am not going to chase you people. Next, a woman who says she hates being a wife and mother and regrets that she had her children. We'll be right back. I do hate being a wife and a mother. Jeff doesn't help me with the kids. My job is to keep the bills paid. I'm falling out of love with my family. Emily should stop whining. Deal with it. And later, I work. That is my contribution to the family. I am the sole breadwinner, and that's all the contribution I should give, and I want Dr. Phil to prove I'm right. <laughs> I feel like we have children, and she should just deal with it and stop whining. chaotic in the home there's no question about it my next guest emily says that she's actually thought about running away from her life because she quotes hates being a mother 
and a wife. I'm married to Jeff, and we have three children. I do hate being a wife and a mother. There were times when I was pregnant with my third child that I did not want him to come out. I just kept thinking about how it was another person that I would have to take care of. I feel overwhelmed because Jeff doesn't help me with the kids. He feels that it's not his responsibility. My job as a husband is to keep the bills paid, keep food in the kids' mouth, keep clothes on their back. Emily's job is to take care of our children. There are days when I just wish I didn't have to pick up my children from daycare. I just think about the chaos when we walk in the door. I've said hurtful things to Emily. I've said I should have listened to my friends when they told me that you were no good for me. I've also told Emily I've wasted my time. I feel that my husband doesn't support me. My kids are against me. Jeff is the good guy, and I'm the bad guy at home. I lay back and watch my kids disrespect my wife just to see what kind of reaction she gives them. The kids like me better than they like Emily. The kids don't respect Emily. I feel like I'm falling out of love with my family. I sometimes sense that my children feel that they're not wanted. I just feel alone. Sometimes I just want to get in my car and drive away until I run out of gas. Emily says she no longer wants to be a wife and mother. Emily should stop whining and just deal with it. Well, first, I have to say, you do have beautiful children. Thank you. Thank you all make great looking kids. Wow. If you knew then what you know now, would you have married her? No. Why not? She was such a magnificent woman. I mean, we talked, we laughed, we did things that normal couples would do. And then all of a sudden, she turned into this mean, hateful person. Mm -hmm. you, you have said there, are, we, we do extensive interviews with you guys ahead of time, as you know. Yes, and, and you were both very forthcoming yes. and, and honest with us. I wrote down some of the things you said that I thought were particularly relevant. You said, quote, you were, are a waste of my time. You ruined my life. I should have listened to my friends who said Emily is a bitch. I'm stuck here because of you. You know what? That's a tough way to feel. I mean, if you feel that, if you really feel that way, you must be really miserable. Let's, let's back up a minute. The reason why I say those things is to get her to back off of me. There are times when I would come in the house, and she knows this, that she would just, I mean, just attack me, verbally attack me for no reason at all. And um, I have so much anger built up inside of me because... I sacrificed so much. I really, I really sacrificed so much. I gave up what I feel would be a wonderful and lucrative career. I gave up a life that, I mean, wow. I had a lot of potential. If you knew then what you know now, would you have married him? No. I mean, when we first met, we were in college, things were good. We had one child. We didn't have careers. Um, I just feel, I mean, he's one, I, I love my children. I truly do. But he wants, you know, several kids. And so I feel kind of <clears throat> that I've given him his children. How's it going with the kids? It's going, it's going great with the kids. But the thing is, okay, she's given me my children, but she hasn't given me the other part that I said I wanted to do with my life. Which is? I want more than staying in, I want more than Iowa. Yeah. If this is really important to him, why, why are you where, somewhere geographically you don't want to be doing something you don't want to do? Particularly if it, if it, if it carries all this resentment from him. What, what, are, why are you wanting to be where you are? I'm from Iowa. I, my family lives, lives there. We're close to my family. Um, I don't want to move. I mean, he, he's always saying, oh, I want this career, I want that career, I want to move here, I want a job where I can travel, where I can move, where I can advance. I don't want to move, you know, to 
Florida to live for a couple years, to move to Texas, to move for a couple years, to move to California. I understand you want to be close to your family, but you're an adult now. This is your family. Your husband and your children are, are your family. You, you don't... Did I finally say something you liked? Yes, I like that. <laughs> All right. All right, we got to take a break. Emily reveals why she says she's jealous of the attention Jeff showers on their children, especially their three-and-a-half-year-old daughter. You're jealous of your three-and-a-half-year-old daughter? Yes. We'll be right back. Alyssa's my baby girl. I spoil her. I call Alyssa my problem child. She will scream in my face, hit me, yell at me. I feel jealous for Jeff giving Alyssa most of the attention. If I paid the same attention to Emily as I do Alyssa, our marriage would be better. I feel that Jeff cares about Alyssa more than he cares about me. Well, Emily admits if she could start over, she would not have children at all. She also admits to being jealous of her husband Jeff's relationship with their three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Alyssa. Now, have you all not said this is not working? Would you rather be miserable in Iowa or happy in Texas? Would you rather be with somebody that is the kind of vibrant woman that you love and admire or somebody that's sorry she ever married you? Wonderful and vibrant. So why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you not negotiating something different here? We've talked about moving, and I'm willing to move. It's just, I feel it would be the un inconsistency of him knowing what he truly wants to do. Wait a minute. You understand yes. your responsibilities go way beyond putting a roof over their heads, right? Yes, I do. Because that's what you said. You said, my I contribution said here is that I pay the bills. That I work. That is my contribution to the family. I am the sole breadwinner, and that's all the contribution I should give, and I want Dr. Phil to prove I'm right. <laughs> I feel like we have children, and she should just deal with it and stop whining. That's, to be honest, true. I mean, a lot of times I feel that way. I mean, I've given, I've given up so much. My Why can't she sacrifice? I, I work full time. So if I came home from work and decided, oh, I'm home, I'm off work, who's going to cook? Who's going to clean? Who's going to put the kids in bed? I don't get to come home and just lay on the couch, watch TV. Do you understand? My day doesn't end when I get off work. Do you understand the weight that is put on my shoulders? If you would understand that. I mean, honestly, honestly, it, it all falls back on me. If you didn't have a job, honestly, if it all falls back on me. If my, fa if my family lived on the streets, if we didn't have food in the house, I mean, if we didn't have transportation, well, what's her husband doing? Why isn't he doing this? Why isn't he doing that? I understand that, that it, you <clears throat> have a lot of weight on your shoulders, but so do I. I work all day. But I have a tough job. But what, you, I, what, you're trying, what you're telling me you want me to do is go to work because I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. A lot of times I don't get home at least until 7 or 8. I'm supposed to come in, prepare dinner, give the kids a bath, Put them to bed. I mean, come that's, on. And that's not what I want, and I don't ask that. Yes, when he walks in the door, the kids run to him because they want to see him. And I try to take advantage, like, I'm going to go take a bath. I'm going to go do something by myself for an hour. I get in the bathtub, knock, knock, knock. We have to go potty. We want this. We want that. The kids are crying. Where's Dad? Watching TV. Those children need their father engaged in their life, interacting with them, involved in their school projects, going to their games, talking to them when they're upset, confused or crying, celebrating when they're happy, bonding with them through hobbies and projects and opportunities and, and things that you can do. They need those things from you. It's not, it just, I tell you what, I would a whole lot, I said this to y'all, you said, oh no, we, I have to run this daycare, I have to do this stuff. Let me tell you, you would be better off living in a single wide trailer with an engaged father than a nice house with an absent father. I, I'll, I'll guarantee you. you. You have to decide. You have to decide what your priorities are. Whether your priorities are bricks and mortar and a house and a car, or whether your priority is that you nurture each other 
and you give your children a chance to flourish in this world. All right, we've got to take a break. Jeff admits to recently leaving their home for one week due to fighting with Emily. Has this couple passed the point of no return? We'll see. They both said they had to do over again. They wouldn't do it. Well, maybe now's the choice point. We'll be right back. Relationships are negotiations, and the negotiation never ends. And if you are so resentful and embittered at her for what you think she has caused you to sacrifice and take away from you, then you need to go back to the negotiation table. If you say, this is not the life I wanted. I wanted a husband, an involved husband, and... I don't want to be a vagabond moving around the country all the time, but I, I, I do want to work at this, then you've got to come back to the table. And you know what? I have a rule in the way I approach negotiations. And I'm a pretty good negotiator. And my number one rule, if I'm sitting down negotiating with you, is to figure out how I can get you the most of what you want. That's my number one rule. It's not getting what I want. I'll get to that in a minute. Trust me, it will be on the list. But oftentimes we want and value different things. So it may be I can give you tons of what you want without costing me what is most important to me. What is most important to you, is it not, is that you want a partner. Yes, I do. You, you want to be treated with dignity and respect. Yes. You want to be loved. Yes. You want to be nurtured. Yes. You want to be protected. Mm -hmm. You want all the things that, that people want when they form a marriage. You, you want help with your children. You want a peaceful life. Yes. There's not one thing she wants that you don't want her to have. It's true. Don't you want her to have a man that loves her? I do love her. And, and, and don't you want her to feel that? Yes. And, and don't you want the kids to be healthy and happy and secure and, and the home to be peaceful? So everything that she prioritizes, you're willing to give. True. And she has just said, look, I'm willing to move. I just don't want to get badgered in a different place. And you, and you admit you're very angry at her. I mean, that's your victim role. You're very angry at her. And I'm saying stop being a victim and start creating your own experience. Step up and say, all right, I will pledge to you and mean it when you say it. If you will support me in, in what I think is important in my ability to provide for this family financially and to feel that I'm doing something I can be proud of, if you will support me in that, I will bend over backwards in taking the stress off of you and, and helping you in this relationship. And, and you two can come back together and be excited again. Yeah. You're, he, he's not an evil guy. He's just really pissed off. I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean to yell and nag all the time, but I don't know what else to do. What you just told Dr. Phil, you said, okay, why should I move to make him happy? Why can't it be about us? She is feeling the need to move back there because your ass is checked out. I have checked out. I have checked out. You check back in, that need will go way down. Seriously, if, I will. if, if you plug back in, that need, she's saying these are the people that love and support me. Why would I go off with the enemy? I and that's will. how I feel. If I'm going to sit at home and be the one to get my kids up and take them to school and daycare and go to work and come home and cook and clean and get them ready for bed. Why not move closer so at the end of the day I can send them to my parents' house so I can have some time to myself? Because it's time to grow up and work this out here. You either need to work this out. You either need to work this out or get a divorce and go home. Those are the options, right? Yes. You either need to work it out or get a divorce and go home. And you have to be willing to broaden your definition of what being a man involves. And listen, I know this because I started out the same place. When, and Robin will tell you, when I was a young doctor, I was working 20 hours a day stamping out disease and suffering. Right. I was going to save the world, and I mean, whoever's got the most toys in the end wins. That was it for me. And then as we began to grow as a couple and as a family, I began to realize that my responsibilities went way beyond how much money I brought to the table. It went to teaching 
our boys to grow up to be responsible young men, to show them how to be husbands and fathers, to show them how to meet their responsibilities and, and contribute to the world. And, and to do that, I had to get involved and, and be plugged in. And, and you know, she's the heart of the home. She's always been the heart of the home. Uh, but I got way more involved, and you can too, and you need to. And if he did that, and you could just, and it came time to move, you'd sit right in his lap and say, let's go. Would you not? If you could trust him to be there for you emotionally and every other way. Yes, and he knows that. And that's what that's what we need to work on, and I will get somebody to help you with that if you need help. We'll be right back. Well, we've been talking about chaos in the family, and I want to thank both of my couples today for coming here and, and talking about this, because look, there is stress. You merge lives, you start sharing space, time, money, energy, effort, then you throw in a couple of kids, and they want to eat every day. They want to, you know, there's always something. Uh, thanks to my expert PR powerhouse owner of People's Revolution and Dr. Phil correspondent Kelly Catrone. Now, you can go out and buy her book and read it. I have. You will like it. It is entertaining and it is informative. If you have to cry, go outside. Uh, it's now out in paperback, and everyone in the audience gets a copy today. So you're going home today. Thanks for being here. So long. on an all-new Dr. Phil. Doctors were saying I was just fat and lazy. I actually had a tumor. Medical gaslighting. They were all told everything was okay. And we're really all shamed that this is all in your head. I have a nerve condition. He said there's nothing he could do, and I should just try eating some soup and listening to some soothing music. That's the point of medical gaslighting, is that patients are constantly getting dismissed. If you feel like you're being dismissed, here's what you need. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. Thank you. Thank you. Medical gaslighting. It's a topic that I know means a lot to so many women who have felt dismissed, shamed, or ignored by doctors while searching for an accurate diagnosis of their medical problems. Now this morning, I did a quick search on TikTok for hashtag medical gaslighting, and I could not believe what I found. 87.6 million views. Almost entirely stories of women who said they were labeled oversensitive when trying to find answers to explain their troubling symptoms. Oversensitive. Here are just a few examples. I saw four doctors within three years, each one of them totally dismissive. Here comes the gaslighting. I asked her why my optic nerve was swollen, and she says some people look that way. He kept comparing me to other patients and just telling me that there's no way I could be in this much pain. Doctors made me feel like the pain I was experiencing wasn't real, and that left me feeling a little bit crazy. I was minimized all along, and I do think it was because I was a woman. I start to gaslight myself, and I start to say, oh, these symptoms I'm experiencing, they're just normal, right? And you literally start to gaslight yourself? It's messed up. Doctors were gaslighting me, saying I was just fat and lazy. I actually had a tumor crushing my pituitary gland. Okay, now, by the end of the day, I want you to be armed with tips on how to be taken seriously at the doctor's office. In fact, I'm going to give you a patient bill of rights, how you can do it, what you need to do. I'm going to spell it out for you real clearly. It could save your life. 
Now, Dr. Julie Taylor is a preventative and functional medical doctor who says gaslighting is real, and it's happening all the time to mostly women of all ages, like my first guest, uh, Felicia. Now, she was just 29 years old when her life came crashing down after a undiagnosed lump turned into stage four breast cancer. Take a look. The local woman was only 29 years old when she found a lump, and she says she was denied a mammogram because of her age. I was in the best shape of my life. I was internationally modeling. Felicia Labounty never imagined that at just 29 years old, she would be diagnosed with cancer. Even when I was diagnosed, I had no other symptoms. I had clean blood work. Except for the lump she felt in one of her breasts. She says she went to a free clinic in Long Beach to have it checked out and was told it was just a benign cyst that she asked at the time to have a mammogram. But that request was denied because of her young age and because she had no family history of cancer. I was like, okay, they said you're okay. Like, trust what they said, trust the doctors. But now she wishes she would have trusted her gut instinct. Within eight months, she says that lump grew much larger. So doctors did approve a mammogram. But by that time, she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer that had spread to her lungs, lymph nodes, and sternum. The now 35-year-old who's in remission wants other young women to know something she didn't know back then, that we can all go get a second opinion. Find another doctor. Felicia, you just have to be, when you think back on that, you just had to be furious yeah. when you finally got answers to this, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I can I can just imagine because we know uh, it's been said to the point that it's become a cliche, but early detection, early intervention is so often outcome determinative. And how long did you get wooled around before you actually got an answer? It took me eight months. So, uh, and, and that entire time, this is growing inside your body, spreading around. All this is happening when you could have intervened day one, minute one. Absolutely. What caused you to keep searching? I, I know it was growing, but something told you this is not a benign cyst. It just wasn't right. It was, I had never had a cyst in my breast ever. I was 29 and I just couldn't understand how something that would randomly pop up at 29 years old was just okay. But I asked her, I said, well, can I have a mammogram? Because this isn't normal. And she said no. Um, the doctor actually applied for it, processed it, and the program that I went to said no. Yeah. Twice. Here's the thing. Medicine has also become, well, it hasn't become, it's kind of always been controlled by insurance. Mm -hmm. And they have actuaries mm -hmm. where they calculate this stuff based on percentages. And having no family history, and being at the age you were, and knowing when the onset of this happens, they calculate this and say, the chance of this being uh, cancerous is really low. So they played the odds. Instead of treating you as a human being, as an individual, uh, they look at their tables and say, no, this is like one out of so many, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the case. Now, Dr. Taylor is here and now, she initially trained in primary care, became disillusioned with the system. You didn't like the speed, the high volume, the, the pressure to move them through. Right, and I think really I didn't like having my patients fit into a box. When you talk about insurance, patients are really fit into a box. And if you, as a doctor, if you sort of, you need to basically treat with inside the parameters that the insurance company sets for you. I wanted to be able to think for myself. I wanted to treat my patients as individuals. I wanted to be able to um, look in at different things that, you know, might not have been dictated by the insurance company, but might be something that I feel is really, really important for my patient. Yeah, I was in private practice for a, a, over a decade, and I felt the same thing. You you have to give a diagnostic code, mm -hmm. and sometimes they just don't fit into that code. Right, and. Um, I actually wrote a book ultimately about how, particularly psychologically, people aren't always this or this or this. There's sometimes several things from these different diagnostic categories and they're just 
there's just not a place for that. You know, medicine is part science, but it's a lot art. Yeah. And every patient is an individual who walks through my door. Yeah. Um, and I spend a lot of time with my patients. I think that this yeah. kind of, you know, 10, 15 minute approach with patients doesn't work. It doesn't allow the patients to tell yeah. their full story and it doesn't allow doctors to really yeah. understand the story. Yeah. How many of you have had heard of medical gaslighting before today? Okay, that's maybe a third of you, okay? How many of you have felt like when you went to the doctor, it was really hurried along? You were kind of in and out. Yeah, okay, that's almost you know, 75% of you. How many doctors did you see before you got to the bottom line? Seven. Seven. Uh, you're Annie, correct? Correct. And you have a situation that very much mirrored Felicia's, right? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, I was 26 when I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. I had found a lump, didn't have a family history, went to a doctor. They said, well, you're too young. Uh, you don't have family history, so you can get a mammogram if you want. But it didn't seem like it was something that I should do. Like, you can get a mammogram, you can get an ultrasound, but my insurance wouldn't approve it. And it took me about nine months to get a diagnosis. Yeah. And but in that time, it went to my liver. It, yeah, it metastasized to your liver during that nine months. Yeah. And uh, you were told at that point that you had how long to live once it had moved? Two to, to five years. Two to five years. Yeah. Yeah. It's been seven. It's been seven. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and and you're saying that everything I was saying before about the actuaries, that you're not a statistic and that. You just didn't think they should just look at the stats. I think if it's a matter of, oh, are we trying to save money or save lives, that shouldn't even be a question. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, this is, you know, we're just here on this morning, and then here are two women, not 20 feet apart, that have been through the same thing. What are the chances? Unfortunately, the chances are pretty good, way too good. Coming up, we're going to meet another woman who says she saw... 30 different doctors within five years for migraines. Now, why is this particularly interesting? Because, look, at least when you have a lump or a broken bone or something, there's something you can see. With migraines, it's not so clear. Did she finally get a diagnosis? Well, she'll tell us how that worked out after 30 different doctors when we come back. I started having episodic migraines in high school. I'm totally losing my train of thought. I know that I fit the profile of something other than just migraine. If enough doctors tell you that you're... My name is Felicia and I am a stage four breast cancer survivor. I was misdiagnosed at the age of 29 because I was told I was too young to have breast cancer and denied a mammogram. I will now continue to fight for the rest of my life, including oral chemo and scans, but I'm happy to say I am now three years cancer free. When it comes to medicine and women's health, gaslighting means dismissing female patients' concerns and complaints. Now, Jennifer says she knows exactly what that feels like because after five years and 30 doctors, Jennifer says she finally got some answers to her, quote, invisible illness. Take a look. I'll be able to see my eyes. I started having episodic migraines in high school. When I was 25, I got diagnosed with chronic migraine. Over the five years since then, I have been getting more and more weird neurological symptoms. I'm totally losing my train of thought. I don't really know what I've said and what I haven't. Every time I said there might be something other than migraine, I started to notice how much I kept getting sent to psychology and they didn't really seem to actually listen to my symptoms. So the reason that that's so hard for me to hear is that over time, if enough doctors tell you that you're crazy, you believe it. And I'm not down for that. I know that I fit the profile of something other than just migraine. And I need to get to the bottom of it. When I did my flat test over the weekend and I sent in my results last night, I was not expecting the wonderful email that I got just now. The doctor wants to check me for a spinal CSF leak. <laughs> They believe me. They believe me now. Well, Jennifer, I'm, gl I'm glad you're here. That's, um, 
it's emotional to watch, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That was only last summer. Yeah. And up to that point, uh, nobody was really taking you seriously. Yeah, they were taking me seriously for migraine, but I was telling them in between my migraine episodes, there's something wrong. And so they just kept changing the type of migraine. Those are those boxes that you were talking about. You know, they, it's migraine. And then once my heart got involved, anxious. I'm anxious because I've been Googling my symptoms too much. Panic attack, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. you've been seeing Dr. Google and you're taking on everything you're reading. And so exactly. they think it's hypochondriasis or hysteria. And that's called something else now, you know, anxiety, illness, disorder and all. But they thought this was basically a, a mental disorder that you were expressing through your body, somatic channels instead of psychologically. Yeah, lost my, my job, my house, we moved, all, all sorts of stuff happened because of my head. It turned out I have high cranial pressure. Doctor, this is a, this is really confounding because this is a diagnostic issue as much as it is a treatment issue because sometimes doctors just don't have the diagnostic sophistication that they need particularly if something is not mainstream, if it's rare, they don't see it a lot. Right. So in medical school, I think it's important for people to kind of understand what type of medical education we have. So we learn about the body, we learn how it works, we learn what happens when it breaks down and how to treat disease with either medication or procedures. We don't learn about how to prevent disease, we don't learn about how to reverse disease, and we don't learn about kind of treating the body as a full system. I think that's why sometimes if there's not a ready diagnosis and it doesn't fall in something they see every day, it's written off uh, because they don't have an answer for it. They don't have the box to put it in. Now, when we come back, a registered nurse for 14 years says she was a victim of medical gaslighting. We're going to find out how that happens to somebody that's actually inside the system who you would think they would slow down and listen because so much of the diagnostic process is patient self-report. And if you've got a registered nurse, you think, okay, I've got a good reliable historian here. I've got somebody that I can listen to that knows how to give me information. But that didn't happen here. We'll be right back. July of 2019, I have a pressure in my chest that just wouldn't go away. I decided to go to the emergency room. Doctors were brushing me off, and immediately my guard was up and feeling like I'm gonna have to defend myself. Now, if you've gone to the doctor only to be told that your concerns aren't serious or that you're distressed, you aren't alone. But you would never think someone in the medical field uh, could be gaslit, but Jenna says, it happened to her, and she is a very sophisticated, experienced nurse, and one that, well, I'll just let her tell the story. I've been a registered nurse for 14 years, and I'm a competitive distance runner. And about three years ago, my legs would get really heavy in the middle of my run. When I'd stop running, I'd have a throbbing headache, and this pressure in my chest that just wouldn't go away. July of 2019, I decided to go to the emergency room and stayed for about a week. And I was basically told, we don't know what's wrong, but just modify your lifestyle. I didn't think anyone was taking me seriously. And I found a specialist. At that point, my chest pain was so bad, it was waking me up out of my sleep. But for safety reasons, my husband and I were using a wheelchair. When the doctor walks in, takes one look at the wheelchair and says, this can't be for you. And immediately, I felt just embarrassed, feeling like I'm gonna have to defend myself throughout this entire appointment. And that's pretty much how it went. Doctors were brushing me off. So then I find a specialist at Stanford who did so many tests and that let them know that my heart wasn't getting proper blood flow. So I had open heart surgery in November of 2019 and the surgery ended up being a huge success. And I'm so glad that I just listened to my gut. Jenna, welcome. Thank you. You know, I'm one of those people that the doctors used to send their patients to because I was in clinical psychology 
but I also specialized in behavioral medicine or medical psychology. So if a doctor had a patient like you, and they thought, well, you know, maybe there's a psychological component here. That may, I'm the kind of person they would send to and say, would you evaluate this person and see if this is in their head, if this psychological or whatever? And if, if they sent you to me, I wouldn't even do a battery of psychometric tests. I, I would talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes and call them back and say, absolutely unequivocally no. If she says there's something wrong with her, if she's having chest pains, you better take this seriously right now. You're a long distance runner. You're, you're focused on your health. You're a registered nurse. I got furious when I read your your case and and saw the situation. This had to be so frustrating to you. Incredibly frustrating and scary because chest pain is a very serious sign that something's wrong and it wasn't being treated that way. I think that that's the point of medical gaslighting is that patients are constantly getting dismissed, that they're having big symptoms, doctors can't really figure out what's going on, and so they just dismiss them as being anxious or stressed or it's all in your head. But or... how do you miss this? Somewhere a village is missing their idiot if they can't see this. Yeah. How, how does this... And how... that was the most surprising thing is that it wasn't one doctor mm. that missed it. It was multiple. And it wasn't like I wasn't telling them, hey, I, I know that this is a heart issue. Mm -hmm. I was saying it all along but kept just being told, no, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, you I was just wondering if perhaps you considered maybe you have migraines. <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> My chest pain was migraines. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. All right, coming up, one woman went in for a throat issue. Doctors told her to just eat some soup. Plus another nurse and another dismissal from doctors. All that when we come back. The patient that I saw today was telling me about how she has never seen a doctor that actually cared to listen to how she feels, and she always leaves the doctor's office feeling unheard and pretty much shamed for coming in and having symptoms. If you are one of those people that have never had a good experience with a doctor, you can fire your doctor. You can find somebody else. Their main goal is to help you feel better, and they will literally stop at nothing until they figure out how to do that. And that's the kind of medical care that you deserve. Now, Allison says when she went to see doctors about her throat, they told her she just needed to eat some soup. Um, Allison, what, what, first off, how did it turn out? Uh, so I have a condition called glossopharyngeal neuralgia, GPN for short, and it's a nerve condition um, that started after a tonsillectomy gone awry in 2016. Um, it was a full year after that surgery of just excruciating throat pain. Um, I kept going back to my ENT thinking I should see a throat doctor, my pain is in my throat, and he's the one who did the surgery. And he kept, he, he prescribed me medicine for nerve issues, but never told me why, which makes me think that he might have known it was something like that, but didn't tell me. And it just kept, he kept blaming it on, oh, your recovery is just taking a long time or whatnot and making it like I was making it too big a deal or something. And it was tough because he would scope me and all the other ENTs I went to for other opinions would scope me and they wouldn't see anything because I didn't know at the time yet that it was because it was nerve pain. The soup reference was to a, uh, a neurosurgeon that I met with once I finally got my official diagnosis. He looked at my MRI and I guess he didn't recognize something on it. Turned out later on it was because it was atypical, but I didn't know that yet either. And he said because he didn't recognize the MRI that I must not have GPN and that there's nothing he could do and I should just try eating some soup and listening to some soothing music. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Leah is finishing up her nursing practitioner degree and works with Dr. Taylor. And she says women going through menopause are more often uh, o overlooked. That's, That's a frustration too, right? It is, it is. And I think a lot of people see menopause as an older issue. Um, I actually started menopause when I was 43. And so I went to, it was an OBGYN in LA, 
And she said, well, it could be menopause, but you're probably just getting old. So here's Ambien and some Prozac. And I said, well, I don't, I'm not really depressed. You know, yeah, I'm not sleeping great. And, you know, I have some brain fog and energy uh, issues, but I didn't think that was it. So I really wanted the blood test. And she wasn't, she was like, I don't, I really don't really check for menopause at 43 and I wouldn't do anything for menopause anyway. Yeah, but the fact is, there, there are trends, there are age ranges that catch most people, but that's not everybody, and you have to treat the individuals. I mean, that's what's so frustrating. And look, and I'm not trying to dog on doctors here, and they do run into patients that do have psychological, psychiatric issues. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Coming up, My next guest spent 19 years seeking help from doctors. She says many of them have the God complex. We'll talk about that after the break. I'm Alana Jacqueline, and I'm a patient advocate. And last month, I learned that my really intense migraines are actually spinal fluid, crushing my brain. And I may or may not need brain surgery. In my experience, surgeries can go bad, very bad. And I have enough medical PTSD to last a lifetime. So I'm going to be smart. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to take my time. And I'm going to be okay. Well, that was patient advocate uh, Ilana, who uses her TikTok to help many women. She says it took almost 19 years to get a proper answer to her health issues. But just last year, a doctor told her that she had conversion disorder, which she says is a lazy diagnosis. She's joining us virtually today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to this, these conversations that we've been having here, and I, I'm, I'm sure, based on everything you've been dealing with and the research that you've been doing, that you're just, you have to have been sitting there going, yep, 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 yep. I was making all the facial expressions behind the scenes. Yeah, I yeah. bet so. <laughs> and you've been through this medical gaslighting yourself, correct? Yes, I have. Uh, My story is very similar to all the women who have shared here today, uh, which as a patient advocate is not something that I'm surprised by at all. Yeah, and what do you think is behind all of this? It's mostly unintentional. I don't think that doctors wake up and say, you know, I think I'll gaslight a patient because I haven't had my coffee yet. Um, There are a lot of factors at play. Uh, One, of course, is time and bandwidth, especially with what's happened during COVID. Doctors really are crushed with a a, a new just load of patients that either have complications from COVID, didn't seek care during COVID and their diseases progressed, but that's definitely had a huge impact on the medical system in general. Um, Doctors are also fighting with insurance because of what they will pay for and what they won't. And a lot of times they just don't order tests because they don't think it will be covered. So they don't even try. And, And then there is medical bias. And that exists in forms you could not even imagine. Uh, of course, there is, you know, race and there's also age. You know, there are, we've heard it a lot today. You're too young. Okay. Um, and then, you know, there's things like lifestyle, education, tax bracket, hair color, uh, walking into an office with, you know, mobility devices. All of these things are something that extend to medical bias and something that doctors take a look at and prejudge patients before they've even said a word or told their story. Yeah. And, you know, what we've seen today that our guests have in common is they're all female. They were all dismissed. They were all told everything was okay. They all had to see multiple doctors. And we're really all shamed that this is all in your head. And as a result, the medical issue progressed with time lapsing, and therefore it got worse and by the time it's dealt with, you're dealing with something more serious than what you started with. Look, when we come back, a patient's bill of rights that I think everyone needs to know about before going to your doctor. Uh, You heard me say before that I think the most important member of the treatment team is you, the patient, and that comes with responsibilities. I'm gonna talk to you about those rights and responsibilities when we come back. Well, 
physicians are the experts in medicine, but you are the expert on you. So if you feel like you're being dismissed, here's what you need. It's, it's a patient bill of rights. Number one, it's always a good idea to check your doctor's history. Look for patient reviews. What do you want to say? My first oncologist, who was absolutely terrible, I ended up looking her up after I fired her, and she was a two on the doctor like yeah. website, and my new oncologist is an 11. Yeah, exactly. Would you have gone if you had seen that it was a two? No, it, you but I didn't it, know you could do that yeah. until afterwards. Yeah, now, now you know. Mm -hmm. So you need to check your doctor out. And then you need to access the state medical board for complaints, or malpractice cases. And I've put in parentheses here, read them. A lot of them are bogus. Read it and see if there's anything to it. Number two, adopt a patient mindset that you're not second class in the relationship. The doctor works for you and owes you quality rendering of services. Number three, be respectful but assertive with doctor and staff. So when I say they work for you, that doesn't mean that you go in there and order them around. You always be respectful, okay? Uh, and that means their staff, whether it's a, someone that's putting you in an exam room or a nurse or whatever, these, these people are hardworking. They're, they've gone to school, they're well-trained, they're hardworking and they're there to help. So be respectful. All of that staff can be very, very helpful to your journey through this. So make them your friends. Number four, be an active member of your treatment team. The doctor is an expert on medical diagnosis and treatment, but you're the expert on your body, and that means you need to be a reliable historian. Five, be forthcoming rather than defensive when you're questioned about your symptoms because they might be asking a lot of probing questions. You may think, well, what do you not believe me? Why are you? No, they're probing to get more information that you may not know is important. Six, prepare a list of symptoms, issues, and questions in advance. And number seven, realize seeking a second opinion is not an insult. I'm gonna have that patient bill of rights uh, on drphil.com so you can all download this and look at it. Is there anything else that you would put here? Is that a pretty thorough list? Yeah, and I think that bringing someone with you, whether it's a spouse or a parent or you know someone who knows your issue that you've talked to them about, to sit beside you and be able to fill in answers for you, I think that that can also be really helpful yeah. to the physician. I, I so admire all of y'all for really fighting for yourselves and being that active member of your treatment team. That's the key. You're alive today, you two in particular, because of that. If I can share too, it's so defeating, you know, to come in expecting help and being felt, being made to feel like you're exaggerating or it's not real and minimizing what you're experiencing. It, it makes you doubt yourself, <laughs> whether this is a big deal, is it real? Uh, but then it also, I think it breaks down that patient doctor communication and relationship. I'm mm -hmm. not coming to you as someone, you know, that I am coming to for help. I'm now more coming in on the defense. So it's just, it starts off yeah. poorly. And so every appointment I go to now, I'm already thinking about how do I convince them instead of I'm here to get help. And I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. No, it, it's not. And you need to define that relationship and, and, I really recommend you let them know. I've had a very traumatic experience here because I was almost denied to death. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand, I come in with some trust issues here. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make eye contact. I'm not looking for a new best friend, <laughs> but I want to be sure that I'm with somebody that's going to take the time to listen to me. And if that's not you, just tell me. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. tell me. And if it's not you, that's okay. Right? Agreed. You agree? <laughs> I agree. Okay. Coming up, the demands of work and family have my next guest at her wit's end. We'll hear her story next. My next guest, Carrie, is like many people who struggle to care for an aging loved one. She's trying to balance working, 
spending time with her preteen son and caring for her elderly mother. Now, Carrie says all these responsibilities are really starting to take a toll on her. Hey, buddy, we're leaving for school in five minutes. I have many responsibilities, and they always have me on the go. On a typical day, I drive my son to school, I go to work, I pick my son up after school, and then I go to my mom's house. Hello. I am my mom's full-time caregiver. I visit my mom almost every day. How are you feeling? Mm, about the same. My mom has gotten to the point where she just refuses to help herself. She has given up. My biggest fear is that something could happen to her and no one would be there to help. I feel with all these responsibilities, this is taking a big toll on me and I cannot continue living this way. An ideal situation would be to have an outside person to help my mom and uplift her to start caring for herself again. My mom means the world to me and I want the best for her. Well, joining me are Carrie and Lakeland Eichenberger, gerontologist and spokesperson for Home Instead. Now, Carrie, can you tell us a little more uh, about your mom? Sure. Well, Dr. Phil, my mom is uh, only 67 years old, and her health has been declining for about two years now. She has a very difficult time getting around, and uh, this has caused her to become very physically weak. Yeah, and that puts more on you. Yes, it does. Yeah, but you do get some peace of mind by actually being able to take care of her, right? It does. Knowing that her needs are being met and that I can be there for her definitely gives me peace of mind. Yeah. It doesn't leave a lot of time for you, though. It does not. So how are you managing it all? It's very tough, Dr. Phil. Uh, I do have a 12-year-old son, and his name is Alex. Um, it's very tough because typically when we do make plans, we have to end up canceling them because my mom calls. So how have all these responsibilities impacted you? Be selfish for a minute and talk about what it's doing to you. I don't have much time for a social life or to do things that I would normally do for myself. Yeah, and Lakeland, Carrie's story is really a common one for someone her age who's caring for an elderly parent. Yes, Dr. Phil, this is something that I see often as a gerontologist. Caring for a loved one is often a thankless job. And family caregivers are often overwhelmed trying to balance it all. And they often need a break. And so that's where Home Instead can help. Home Instead provides families with services that range from personal care, medication management, meal preparation, to specialized Alzheimer's care and hospice support. So, Carrie, do you think you and your mom could benefit from a service like that that filled in a lot of those uh, areas that you're having to do now on your own? Absolutely, Dr. Phil. Uh, I think it would help out greatly and um, it would give me peace of mind and it would allow me to do more things that, that I want to do and that's hang out with my son and, and take care of him. Yeah, and knowing that your mom was being taken care yes. of too. So Lakeland, I understand that you have some important information for Carrie, is that right? Yes, Carrie. In honor of National Family Caregiver Month and to acknowledge your dedication to caring for your mom, we have a special gift for you. Home Instead will be providing a trained care professional to help with your mom for the next four months. Oh, wow. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You deserve it. Uh, and one more thing, Dr. Phil, uh, we are expanding our team of care professionals and we're hiring in all 50 states and across Canada. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Um, look, for more information about joining their team, or if you're looking to hire a care professional for a loved one, just visit homeinstead.com, whether you're looking to join the team or use the team for yourself, because it is a great organization. And Carrie, we wish you the best for you and for your mom. I hope this gives you a break and lets you kind of recharge your battery. Thank uh, you. Give you time and energy and take care of yourself. I will, thank you're, you. You're the number one thing. Look, I wanna thank all of my guests today and a special thanks to Lakeland uh, Eichenberger and Home Instead. For more information about today's episode, or if you'd like to share your story, log on to drphil.com. And just because we're done here on stage, our conversation from earlier will continue on Facebook, YouTube, and drphil.com. So head over there to hear more about today's topic. 
Now, if you want to add your voice to the conversation, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you're in the Los Angeles area or you plan to be, we'd love to have you join us up here on stage in our studio audience. Just go to drphil.com, click on be part of the audience for all the details. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks. Next week, I'm discussing the victimhood culture and ways we can get out of victimhood with author Pastor James Ward. He says that the core conviction to overcome is the first step in shifting from victim to zero victim thinking. And uh, also listen to Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret. She really unlocks the secrets of some of the greatest uh, thought leaders and innovators uh, in the country today. You can check them both out on Apple Podcasts or really wherever you listen. Thanks for being here. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.
today on Dr. Phil. I'm going to be a bride. She's ready for her wedding. Bonnie asked me over the phone to marry him. But she hasn't seen the groom. I never met him in person. Has she been hooked by a catfish? We have done the research. Donnie claimed to be staying at the hotel in Cairo. Have you ever talked to that hotel? No, I haven't. Donnie is in the Air Force. In the Cavalry. Yes. Lieutenant Colonel, does the Air Force have Cavalry? No, sir. But you've sent him a lot of money. These love letters? He plagiarized them. Well, I did the same thing to him. Yeah, but he didn't send you $50,000, did he? Is this a love scam? He hung up. He told me not to text him anymore. Joy, can we try to call him? Donnie, this is Dr. Phil. Let's do it. I hate to see people suffering, and you've heard long enough. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Both of you, take I'm going to get you the help that you need. In five, four, This is going to be a changing day in your life. Go, Dr. Phil. you a question if someone asked you to marry him via text message <laughs> would you say yes and then give your social security number and driver's license information to his friend a person you've never met this is a real life story of my first guest joy take a look Bonnie asked me over the phone to marry him I said yes I will marry you the military is saying if he proves that he has family, then they'll let him go. That's why we got married. So his lawyer made up a fake marriage certificate and sent it to the military. I had to give him my social security number, my date of birth, and my driver's license. In order to release Donnie, they need to verify the marriage certificate. We did vows with each other, a text message. He would send them first, and then I would repeat them back to him. When I got married to him over the phone, that's a new beginning for both of our lives. Bonnie is stuck in Egypt, and we are getting married here on October 4th, 2014. He has even given me a $3,000 limit on a wedding gown, and he asked me, is $20,000 enough to spend on a wedding? For around here, yes, that's plenty. <laughs> I'm excited to be married again. So how did this blushing bride-to-be meet the man of her dreams? Here's their love story. I met Donnie on Facebook. There was just something about Donnie that made me want to be his friend. Donnie is a senior officer in the Air Force. Sometimes I can't understand him on the phone because he has a French accent. Donnie is from Alabama. I've never been this happy until I met him. When I first met Donnie, he was in Nigeria. He tried to come see me twice, and then I got the call from the doctor saying that he got shot. I was devastated. I was crying for two days. I talked to him maybe two weeks after he came out of the coma. Since I have known Donnie, he has been robbed, shot, tried to commit suicide, hospitalized, in a coma, and arrested. He asked me for money about a month after I met him. I am paying for Donnie's hotel stay, but it's $650 a month. I sent Donnie money for medical bills, hospital, flight, phone. I have probably a sent about $35,000, but he promises he's paying me back. Donnie's in Cairo, Egypt right now. That is his last assignment. When he gets home, we will move to Alabama. We will be living in a beautiful home with a wait staff. We have a relationship, we are in love. I, I never actually met Donnie. I believe in my heart, Donnie is real. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to meet you. I'm and, glad to meet you too. Uh, why did you fall for him? What was it about him? I didn't get all the love and care from my soon-to-be ex-husband that right. he was giving me. So he was filling a void. There was a lot of things that he said to me that I needed to hear that my ex-husband never told me. Yeah, for example? Donnie said he would always make me happy, make me smile. But when Donnie met me, he said I was the person he wanted to marry. 
Well, you say when you met him you, online. I never met him in person. Well, here's a little of his background. Here's what we know about him, what you've told us, and what we've been able to find from his writings to you. He's in the United States Air Force, Troop C, 1st Squadron, 32nd Cavalry Regiment, Task Force Bandits. Never married. His parents are deceased. He was stationed in Nigeria when he was shot and robbed. Okay, military refused to pay his medical expenses. I don't know why they refused to pay it. Yeah. Released from the hospital eventually and is living in Cairo in a hotel. Now, he said he tried to resign from the Air Force, but he was told no because he doesn't have a wife or family, so he's in for life. Yes, he's in for life. United States of America Air Force <laughs> said yes. if you're not married, you're in for life. Buddy. Yes, the United States Air Force told him that. On November 9th of 2013, you all had a, a phone marriage. Do you consider yourself married now? And I, I know you haven't. In that. our eyes, we consider ourselves married by that text message. Right. So he had his phone wedding, but he needs your financial help to get home. Do you make a lot of money? I don't make a lot of money. So what do Joy's friends and family think about her online boyfriend who she has never met, but in her mind and his, apparently, they are committed to each other, a heart marriage. Plus, Joy went shopping for a wedding dress in preparation for her upcoming wedding. We'll see what happened during that visit when we come back. I'm at a bridal shop. I need to get a wedding gown. I love it. I'm going to be a bride. Yeah, this is going to be me in a few months. And later, I just know what you told us, and we added it up, and it gave us a grand total that you've sent him us. $51,927.90. The ways I've sent Donnie money was through Western Union, MoneyGram, and I buy those green dot money packs. Western Union stopped me for sending money because they said I was sending it too often. I do not believe he is scamming me. Well, that was Joy talking about how she sends money to her fiancé, Donnie Four a man she met online almost a year and a half ago, but has yet to meet in person. Now, Joy and Donnie have set their real wedding date for October 4th, 2014, and like any bride-to-be, Joy has been making plans. Donnie gave her a budget of $3,000 for her wedding dress, and she spent some time at Alfred Angelo Bridal Shop in Beverly Hills looking for the perfect dress for her special day. Take a look. I'm at a bridal shop. I need to get a wedding gown, and I'm very excited, and I'm going in now. Hello. Hi. What brings you in today? I'm getting married in a few months, and I'm looking for a gown. This is the one that I like online. I picked as my favorite. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely try that one on. I like those, too. Well, we can try that one, too. Well, let's get started, OK? OK. I love it. Putting the gown on makes it feel more real that I'm getting married soon. Donnie does not know I'm here trying on gowns. He thinks I'm waiting till he comes home to try on gowns. I'm gonna be a bride. I really love this one. Donnie would love it if it was blue on top because that's Donnie's favorite color. Donnie wants you to show off my boobs. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be me in a few months. This is the dress. This is the dress I'm getting married in. So you liked it? I love that dress. When Joy decided to share her excitement about finding her wedding dress with her fiance, Donnie, um, well, the call did not go well. Let's have a listen. I'm asking him if I can call him. He telling me to call him. Hello? Hi. I want to tell you why I went shopping. Uh, I was looking at wedding gowns. And I found one I like. 
I'm going to buy it. 1,500 it cost, okay? Babe, um, I'm at the shop now and they want permission to use your voice. Dr. Phil show. Is it okay to use your voice? He hung up. You tell me not to text him anymore. Why do you think he hung up? I don't know. He thinks I'm lying to him. And he thinks someone's trying to track him down. <laughs> Everything. He won't talk to me. He's thinking of killing himself. He's going back to work and leaving me. He's telling me I think he's a scammer and I don't believe him. He's not answering me anymore. No, he'll never forgive me. <laughs> so that call didn't go well. No, that call didn't go well, no. But I'm guessing y'all have made up. Oh, uh, yeah, we made up. He was very happy I was looking at wedding dresses. Uh -huh. The problem was when you said Dr. Phil. Yes, he was very upset about that. So he knows who Dr. Phil is? He knows who Dr. Phil is. Yeah, because I'm on in Alabama. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you are. He doesn't really sound Alabama-like, though, does he? He is not originally from this country. Uh -huh. He is from the UK. He came to this country as a kid with his parents and become a US citizen. And he has a French accent because he spent a lot of time around French people and picked up that accent when he was in the military. In the US military? In the US military. I read some of the emails that Donnie sent to Joy and I found some very interesting things in those. We're going to talk about that when we come back. He went and cut and pasted this from a love letter site and sent it to you. Well, I did the same thing to him. Yeah, but he didn't send you $50,000, did he? And later, Donnie's cell phone is actually listed in your name. My name? Did you open a phone in his name? No, I didn't. He has opened up an account using your name because the phone number you're calling is you. Donnie always makes me feel special. He writes me romantic emails twice a week. I fell in love with you and I'll never let you go. I love you more than anything. I just had to let you know. He said I was his dream woman to marry. And you see this box full of binders and this one down here? This is all of the research that we have done here to try to figure out why the military would do what they're doing, who this guy is for real, if it's who he says he is or, or not, to make sure that, that you're okay. Now, this first one has to do with money that you've sent to him. What we know is you met Donnie in November of 2012, right? Uh, and we know that in November and December, you sent him $3,430. What were you sending him money for right after you met him? Could be medical bills. From his being shot and robbed? And they weren't feeding them over there either. The United States Air Force was not feeding the troops. Yes. Then in January, February, you sent him $5,346.90. Then in April, May, you sent him $15,300. What do you reckon happened then? His friend Fred. What, what happened with Fred? He got shot. Fred was in the same troop as him. Same troop. I bet Obama's loving you because you're taking care of all this. <laughs> all 
all these military. Okay, August through December, 5,302. January, February, 8,749 for a total of 38,127. Okay, however, you also sent him your tax return. You also said you paid his hotel bills for 12 months. And we added it up and it gave us a grand total that you've sent him of $51,927.90. So this would be a relevant fact in our decision. So I'm gonna put this over here. I, I understood that he really had stolen your heart. I mean, y'all have talked through emails a lot, right? Yeah, we talked a lot of emails. Yeah. And in this one, for example, he says, Joy, you make me feel special, like I'm your one and only. You make me feel like I'm a star in the sky lighting up your life. You make me feel safe when I'm near you, wrapped up in your arms. But he's never been wrapped up in your arms, has he? No, he hasn't. Well, we, we did a lot of research on what he has had to say to you. But here's the problem. We took this exact email and we researched it on the internet and there are websites out there that list scam emails and content. And look what we found. He says to you, you make me feel special like I'm your one and only. On this website, it says, you make me feel special like I'm your one and only. Coincidence, maybe. He says, you make me feel like I'm a star in the sky lighting up your life. That's kind of a unique way to say it, right? On this website, you make me feel like I'm a star in the sky lighting up your life. You make me feel safe when I'm near you, wrapped up in your arms. Over here, he says, you make me feel safe when I'm near you, wrapped up in your arms. He didn't write this. We found the very personal romantic email he sent to you on his website. This is one email, but it's suspicious. He sent you another email. How was I to know that you were watching me sleep? I awoke to see you laying there, and just then you smiled and said hi, and that just melted me. I wish all of my heart that I could wake to your beautiful eyes for the rest of my life. When you read that, did, did you wonder what he was talking about? Because that had never happened? <laughs> yes, I wondered what it meant. Well, we went to this website. He says to you, how was I to know that you were watching me sleep? How was I to know that you were watching me sleep? I awoke to see you laying there, and just then you smiled and said hi. I awoke to see you laying there, and just then you smiled and said hi. He didn't write this. He went and cut and pasted this from a love letter site and sent it to you as though it was from him to you. Well, I did the same thing to him. Yeah, but he didn't send you $50,000, did he? <laughs> well, we got to put that over here because that's suspicious, right? Everyone you see in yellow is plagiarized. This guy hasn't written to you. You are in a cut and paste romance. We got to put these over here. Do you agree that that's suspicious? My opinion, no. Okay, no. Joy says Donnie Four, who is currently stuck in a hotel in Cairo, Egypt, is a millionaire who has a mansion with servants in Alabama. Now, we poked around. We did some sleuthing. We're going to reveal what we found out about that next. It's 9 a.m., and we're in a very small town in Alabama looking for a Donnie Four. Is there a Donnie Four that lives here? Is this picture familiar to you at all?
Now, Donnie claims that he's stuck in Cairo, Egypt. All he wants to do, he says, is get home to his mansion in Alabama. The one he claims is equipped with a staff of servants. Well, you know what? We went to Alabama. We wanted to know what was really going on there. Here's what happened. It's 9 a.m. and we're in a very small town in Alabama looking for a Donnie Four. We got a tip that there's an address around here that is linked to Donnie Four. So let's see, I think this may be it right here. Hi, hello, hello. Hi. hi. My name is Mary Ann and I'm with the Dr. Hey. Phil Show. Is there a Donnie Four that lives here? No. No. Is there a Donnie at all that lives here? My name is Donnie. Your name is Donnie. Right. But it's not Donnie 4. No. This is a picture that we have of a Donnie 4. Is this picture familiar to you at all? No, I've never seen this person before. And you don't know anybody by the name of Joy? No. Doesn't ring a bell at all. No, I've never I've never spoken with anyone by that name. And um, how, how long have you lived in this area or on this property? Uh, over 20 years. Do you know of anybody who, with that last name, Four, that lives close by in this community? Uh, I really don't know any Fours. I try someone at the uh, post office area. They may know. Thank sure. you so much. You're I'm welcome. sorry to bother you. Well, that's no problem. I spoke with the postmaster. They do not recognize anybody who looks like this. So now I found a general store and I'm gonna head inside to see whether or not anybody recognizes Donnie's photo. We're in town looking for a person by the name of Donnie Four. Does this man look familiar at all to you? No. No, and how long have you been in town? Uh, for about eight years. Well, thanks so much for your time. Right, I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So, Dr. Phil, we've spent all day in southern Alabama looking for a Donnie Four. There is no Donnie Four here. Donnie said he lives in a mansion with servants in Alabama. There are no mansions around here. Our search has turned up empty. We have searched tax records, phone records, utility records, everything there could possibly be. There is not now, nor has there been in the past, a Donnie Four ever lived there at all. And th the thing that concerns me is, you know, he says he's a millionaire. He claims he has a mansion. He claims he has servants. This is apparently an address that this person has used. This is it. This is the address. It's about a little over 2,000 square feet. I mean, if you got a maid and a butler, they're on a cot in your bedroom. There's just, there's no, it's, there's, there's no mansion in this city or around it. And we check all of the records. It, it, it not only does it not live there now, there's never been anybody that's ever lived there by that name. Have you checked his military record? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. we, we check, we got a private investigator. Now, not just our producers, we got a private investigator here. And I want to share with you the findings that we have on this individual. Here's what we found out. Donnie's cell phone is actually listed in your name. My name. Well, did you open a phone in his name? No, I didn't. Okay, then what he has done is he has used your personal information and he has gone and opened up an account using your name because the phone number you're calling is you. Now, Donnie claimed to be staying at the hotel in Cairo. Have you ever talked to that hotel? No, I haven't. Why not? Because I don't have the number. And this lawyer, this barrister, David Cohen, he says, thanks for getting back to me. I have all what you send to me and I will start the processing by Monday because it already weekend, and I have a lot of work in court this week, and by God's grace, I will get back to you next week. Have, I'd get me a new lawyer. <laughs> that, that boy can't write. So his involvement was to create a false marriage certificate so Donnie could get out of the military because you don't get out unless you're married. Correct. Well, we tracked down the real barrister, David Cohen, who is an immigration attorney in Montreal, Canada. 
and he's joining us on Polycom now. Uh, sir, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. I hope I can help out. Well, I hope so, too. Let's just get straight to it. Do you represent someone by the name of Donnie Four? Uh, uh, Dr. Phil, I've done a thorough verification of all of our records. And not only do I not represent uh, Mr. Donnie Four, we never had a client uh, with that name or actually anything close to that name. Right. And did, did you ever agree to create a false marriage certificate to get someone out of the military? I absolutely not. Uh, David, let me again say to everyone, if you see the name Barrister David Cohen associated with something that looks fishy or some scam, it is not this David Cohen. He has had his name misappropriated. He is a, a lawyer of the highest reputation, been practicing for over 30 years. So this, just know this guy's on the right side of this, not the wrong side. And I thank you so much for coming on and helping me. Thank you. All right, we're going to have to take a break. Um, I'd like to speak to Donnie myself. I want to hear his voice. We're going to call him when we get back. Do you have your phone? Yes, I do. Can you dial it? See if you can get the boy on the phone. You asked me earlier, did we look at his military record? The answer is yes. Donnie has made several claims about issues he's having with the United States Air Force. So joining us to address these claims is retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Bill Ajax Paris. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, let, let's just talk about this. Donnie claims that he's in the Air Force. Troop C, 1st Squadron, 32, the 32nd Cavalry Regiment, Task Force Bandits. Does the Air Force have cavalry? No, sir. None of those names, uh, except the word squadron, appear in any Air Force designation. That is not an Air Force unit, and no one who knows anything about the Air Force would claim that that was an Air Force unit. That's a lie. I don't know anything about military. No, he does. <laughs> <laughs> See this guy right here? This is Lieutenant Colonel Paris right here. How many years are you in the military? 21 years. 21 years in the Air Force, right? If, if you're in the military and you get shot down on the street, do they just step over you and tell you <laughs> you're on your own? Well, Absolutely I mean, not. I know we've had budget cuts, but come on. <laughs> Absolutely not. The Air Force and all the services take excellent care of their troops in any medical situation, whether it was in combat or whether he was a victim of a crime. It doesn't matter. He will get med medical care. Okay, then he said that he's told since he has no wife or family that he was in the Air Force for life and cannot resign. Yes, that, that is what he told me. You married? No. <laughs> How the hell did you get out? I served my time. You served your time? Yes. There is no such thing as in the Air Force for life, period. Better put those over here then. Now, <clears throat> we also had his voice analyzed. We had a linguistics expert listen to this, uh, Dr. Alan Perlman. And he is not Hispanic, African, or European, definitely not a native speaker of American English, probably South Asian, Pakistani, Indian, or Bangladeshi. Do you think those pictures might not be his? Yeah, let, let, let me be real clear about that. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that this man is named Donnie Four, and there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that he is in any way associated with this scam. Like Barrister David Cohen, someone has stolen his image off the internet, stolen his picture, and decided to use it is what it would appear. Uh, we are showing these pictures knowing that the man in these photographs is not, not a scammer. We can add the voice analysis 
to this pile, can we not? So that's all the evidence that suggests that this is not what it appears to be. Here's all the evidence that he is who he says he is. Nothing. There's nothing over here. Tell me what you think, feel, and believe at this point. That he isn't who he is. How do you feel about that? I feel very upset and embarrassed. But you would rather know than not know. Yes, I'm glad I came. I'd like to talk to Donnie. Um, so, Joy, can we try to call him? Do you have your phone? Yes, I do. Oh, can you dial it? See if you can get the boy on the phone. If he answers, I'll let you speak to him. Okay. Please leave your message after the tone. Hey, Donnie, this is Dr. Phil. And uh, I'm here with Joy. And um, I would really like to talk to you. Um, because I'd like to share with you that um, there have been some real advances in tracking IP addresses down and locating users of that sort of thing. You know, in case you run into some chicken <laughs> scumbag that's ripping money off of people. And so, given that that can happen, myself and uh, some of my associates in the Cyber Crimes Division uh, here in LA would love to chat with you. You have a nice day. <laughs> All right, we have to take a break. A former guest who sent over $63,000 to a man she never met, well, she's back. Sandy's online boyfriend, Max Moose Advisor, claimed to also have been in the military, but unable to see her because he was stuck, this time, in Afghanistan. She has a message for this very, very nice lady right here when we come back. I've sent cash to Max in cereal boxes. You have $25,000 in cash. You're putting in a cornflakes box and shipping to Ghana. If not for Dr. Phil, I would probably be destitute. Sandy is a former guest who sadly relates to Joy's online relationship experience all too well. Take a look at what happened when Sandy last appeared on the show, and also, there's a surprising update. When I met Max, he was in Afghanistan with the UN peacekeeping forces on a top secret mission. Every time we try to meet, there's always a problem. I've sent cash to Max in cereal boxes. What did you say to yourself? You're standing in the kitchen, you have $25,000 in cash, you're putting in a cornflakes box and shipping to Ghana. He has told me that his name was Max Moose Advisor. I thought it was very strange. We cannot find one record of one human being in the history of the United States whose last name was Advisor. By being on the show, I discovered that I was being scammed by someone in Ghana. I was very sad that this person wasn't who I thought he was. If not for Dr. Phil, I would probably be destitute. Since appearing on the show, I met a really nice gentleman who actually lives across the street from me. Dr. Phil told me to keep my eyes open to love, and I did. If you're chasing this relationship, you're gonna miss the guy at the grocery store or at your church or around the corner. There is a happy life on the other side once you work through this. Okay, well, Sandy, I'm so glad to see you and with a smile on your face. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Phil. It's good to be here again. My heart goes out to Joy. I, um, I know exactly where she is right now, how she's feeling. Um, but I want her to know that there, there really is life after this. You've just got to realize that Dr. Phil's right and this guy doesn't exist. He's not who he said he is. Is there any doubt in your mind? This is not real. It, it's done. You totally get it. Yes, I get it. Look, I, I, I want Joy to know there are people 
uh, on her side. Her friends at home who wrote into the show and Joy's mother, Joyce. She's been listening and is joining us on the phone right now. Joyce, are you there? Yes. Do you believe he's real or do you believe he's not real? I believe he's not real, but if I find him, he's going to be <laughs> gone. Well, I, I, I certainly cannot advocate vigilante violence, so you just have to make up <laughs> you your own mind. You won't know when it happens, honey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Now, please meet Dr. Julie Albright. She is a digital sociologist who has studied this phenomenon of online relationships and scams. Doctor, thank you so much for being here. This is, this is rampant, right? It is rampant. Uh, it's changing its character, though. Uh, obviously, deception's gone on online for a long time. But it used to be people just wanted to maybe hook up. An overweight woman would send an old photo a hundred pounds ago, hoping that the guy would fall in love with her inner self. Uh, so that kind of thing went on. Or, or a guy would say he was single when he's married. That's the most common one. But in recent years, it's taken a sinister turn. And that's where you're seeing this. This is of a criminal nature. You use the term sometimes called spear phishing. Talk about that. Yeah, the idea of spear phishing, uh, oftentimes uh, this is a, a corporate, corporate espionage type of thing, cybercrime, where they're trying to get information, they're trying to get passwords. But this is a new kind of spear phishing, I see it that way, where they're actually targeting, you know, possibly lonely women, uh, women that are more vulnerable, or maybe they've gone through relationship troubles, and they'll target them to get money. It isn't about getting a relationship, which is what it was about before. Now it's about uh, finances. Yeah. Look, the, th the thing I want you to understand is this. Th this is a whole process. You went through a marriage that left you more than unsatisfied. It made you vulnerable to this kind of thing. And because you had needs and you wanted them to be met. And you do have needs, but there's a healthy way to meet those. And, and I want you to let me help you by getting you some professional help back at home that will sit down and help unravel all of this for you, help you get a grip on it. I don't want you to leave it here feeling like, well, okay, now I got nothing. That is absolutely not true. Let's work through this and be better for it. Okay, will you let me do that? Yes. Okay, we'll be right back. Coming up, what's getting the audience this excited? You'll find out next. Well, as you know, my wife Robin loves to give back. On Fridays, Robin is going to be sharing with you some of her favorite things. Now, the first item that I just really don't know much about, so you're going to have to do this one. Well, it's the T3 Featherweight 2 Blow Dryer. And I, yes, and I am so excited to introduce to you this blow dryer because it is clinically proven to be healthier than air drying your hair. And it dries your hair fast and with results that really, really last. It increases body, shine, combability, and style retention. And I really love this blow dryer so much that I'm sending the entire audience home. <laughs> And if anybody wants two, you can have mine. Uh, uh. Okay. Sometimes I just don't have the time or energy to do my own hair. So I've teamed up with Blow, North America's original blow dry bar. Blow is a quick and convenient solution to getting your hair done, and they are open seven days a week. They only charge $40 for a wash and a blowout, so no matter your hair type or length, they are the largest blow dry bar chain in the world and everyone should experience this affordable luxury. So I'm sending the whole audience home with a free blowout from Blow. And I am so excited because I'm also sending the entire audience home with a 30 day skincare kit from my new skincare line. 
to say that to help celebrate the launch of my new skincare line, I have created a lip gloss collection called Everlasting Love, named after our granddaughter Avery. And everyone in the audience is going home with a lip gloss from the Avery Lip Gloss Collection. So they all give it. I also want to point out that 100% of the net profits from Robin's lip gloss line are being donated to Robin's foundation when Georgia smiled and will directly help women and children affected by domestic violence. So, uh, to learn more, log on to robinmcgrawrevelation.com. I want to thank all of my guests today. We'll see you next time.